This episode is proudly brought to you by Helix NJ, which recently made some big news, some very big news. In case you missed it, Nokia Bell Labs announced their plans to invest in a new state-of-the-art research and development facility located at Helix NJ. Nokia considered approximately 25 different locations across the country for their new home, but ultimately they chose the Helix because of its proximity to major cities, its access to talent, its community of industry-leading companies and universities, and because of its cutting-edge facilities and environments. For those not yet familiar, Helix NJ is a new five-acre state-of-the-art innovation district located in the heart of New Brunswick, New Jersey, that will house some of the world's most brilliant minds, projects, and organizations pursuing critical, life-improving innovations. To learn more, visit www.helixnj.com. The New Jersey Innovation Institute is the conduit that connects one of the nation's leading polytechnic institutions, New Jersey Institute of Technology, to the outside world. Created to leverage the vast resources of NJIT, the New Jersey Innovation Institute is focused on fostering innovation, building companies, and upskilling New Jersey's workforce. NJI employs over 100 people and generates over $35 million in revenue per year in industries such as defense and healthcare. To learn more about the innovative strides being taken at the New Jersey Innovation Institute, head to NJII.com. Entrepreneurs and small business owners, are you feeling overwhelmed by lack of capital, growth challenges, or personal branding? You are not alone. UCS Advisors is here for you. We're professional capital raising advisors committed to helping you secure funding and grow your business. Are you ready to impress investors? Check your investor readiness with our free 45-second quiz at UCSquiz.com. We believe in you. Visit UCSquiz.com and start your success journey. And remember, always be willing to achieve your greatness. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Greetings from the Garden State, powered by the New Jersey Lottery. I'm your host, Mike Cam. We are here in Landing, New Jersey, right? That's where we are, uh, at the NJII's Comet Advanced Manufacturing Facility with Michael Johnson, president of the New Jersey Innovation Institute. I got all that right. That was a lot of intro words. That was sure. fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so also, this is a momentous episode because not only are we going to talk about a lot of really cool things that we're sitting here in this basically like a laboratory, essentially, like a robotics lab. Uh, but you're our first sibling ever on the show, which is really cool. So we had Dan, your brother Dan, who was a friend of mine, on the Halloween special episode. Uh, so there's no pressure, but that was like one of our most listened to episodes of all time. So, <laughs> I'll try and live up to that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, there's a lot of cool stuff here, maybe not skin wallet level. Uh, just that, that was different technology of the time. Yes. Yeah. Cutting edge back in the 1830s. <laughs> it was, kind of. <laughs> uh, you know, doing like, they were doing experiments, you know, Frankenstein level experiments. I think that was Princeton actually was involved in that. So yeah. 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 Um, all right. So uh, it's really exciting to be here. This is a really cool place. It's a little off the beaten path, so to speak, but um, we, just, we just did a quick tour with, there's 3D printers behind us on this side. There's a tank, like a literal, like a mini tank, but a tank <laughs> nonetheless uh, behind us, like a whole bunch of stuff. We'll kind of get into what all that is, but um, if people have been listening to this show, they haven't checked out NJI because NJI is one of our sponsors. Uh, so shout out again to them and you. But uh, let's do 30,000 foot view, what NJI is, uh, like what you guys do and how it works and all that kind of stuff. And then we'll kind of get into some more details after that. Excellent. First of all, thanks for, uh, for having me on. Um, NJI is an organization that is wholly owned by NJIT. So we have about 120 employees. We do roughly $40 million a year in revenue. And what we are is an organization that's focused on solving big problems the world faces. But it's more, I would say, interesting to describe the problem that we actually were started to address. So about 10 years ago, NGI was formed at NGIT. And the reason it was formed was because academia is tough to work with. In the U.S., we have these great bastions of research that are academic universities. You have lots of smart people. You have lots of great resources. But it's tough for the outside world, governmental organizations or private industry to actually tap into those resources. So what NGI is, it's a standalone corporation that's owned by NGIT that's nimble, it's quick, it has its own accounting team, its own finance team, its own marketing team, but it's able to leverage all the resources of NGIT as the sole owner of our organization. So we can tap into faculty, we can tap into research projects. So we're able to be the conduit between um, NGIT and the outside world and leverage all that great expertise. So we're able to go after things like the facility we're in here, which is an advanced manufacturing space for 
uh, testing innovative manufacturing technologies for the military, but also training the workforce that's going to run all these machines and actually build um, all the new tools in the future. So for us, um, we're a go between the outside world and NGIT. Yeah, that's really cool. And your background, uh, let's talk about that real quick. So you're president of NJI. You have been for how long? Four months. So <clears throat> ex well, you know, been here for forever. Right. Uh, talk <laughs> to me about like, you know, kind of like where you came from and then maybe the path that led you to this. As a kid, I was always very interested in robotics and science. I was blowing up rockets. I was flying RC airplanes, always super interested in STEM. And I think for me as a kid, my dream was always to do science as a living, do engineering as a living, build stuff, blow stuff up. That was always really exciting to me. Um, I was capped the robotics team in high school, really nerdy. Sure. Um, also middle school. So I was always very involved with that. Also played football as a kid, so very athletic as well. Um, but I did an undergrad degree in biology, um, did that, and I went on to um, actually intern at NASA. And through that experience, I was, um, you know, I was you know, surrounded by all these great scientists from all over the world. And I realized that the career I wanted was to be a scientist. My dad was a science teacher, but it never occurred to me that science and being a scientist was actually a profession until I worked at NASA. And through that experience, I realized, oh, yeah, I got to go get a PhD. I got to go be a real scientist and do real work. Yeah. So I went to uh, Rutgers. I did a PhD program actually in environmental sciences focused on trying to create biofuels from algae, like the pond scum you see in ponds with spring and fall. And um, through that program, I met another PhD student, Tom Volani, and he had invented a really cool technology for imaging tissues. So if you have like a, a mouse brain or a biopsy, he had developed a way to image tissues in 3D. He was another PhD student. And um, essentially, instead of taking like a mouse brain or biopsy and cutting into slices and put them on those like little flash microscope yeah. size, he created a way to actually image tissues in 3D. So we were both PhD students. I thought it was wicked cool. I said, let me get involved with this. Let's start working together. We built the company Visicall around that technology. And we took it from just the two of us um, to a company with about 35, 40 people that we sold to a Swedish-based life sciences company. So we licensed the IP out of Rutgers, we built the company, we raised money, and we picked up all 20 of the top 20 pharma companies as clients. And essentially what we were doing was trying to answer research questions for them using this technology that we had developed. Um, I stayed on there after we got bought for about two years, um, originally as a CEO of my own company, and then we merged my company with one of our parent companies, daughter companies, and I was a chief commercial officer for both of them, overseeing um, a portfolio of life science tools, reagents and kits, um, and people all over the world. Um, and then after that, I knew when I sold the company that I want to do something else. I want to move on to the next challenge. I wanted to do something outside of just life sciences where my background was. Defense, I thought was really cool. Um, so I really wanted to expand out there. Yeah. And I also loved commercialization and I also loved actually academia and doing science. So when um, NGI reached out to me, I, you know, I just jumped at the offer yeah. and I had actually met with the, um, the former team about six months prior to them reaching out and on the way home, I actually told my wife, I would love that job one. Yeah, that place sounds cool. awesome. Yeah. And then just kind of serendipitously, they reached out and, um, yeah, I loved it. I mean, yeah. it's a great opportunity. And for our organization, we're able to touch all these disparate fields of research that NGIT faculty are focused on. And we're trying to get those to the outside world. So we're trying to partner with industry. We're trying to bring cutting edge technologies to the market. So like an example is we're trying to um, do work with Newark um, and Bergen County Prosecutor's Office to actually uh, look at body cam footage and try and predict bad things that are gonna happen before they actually happen. Interesting. So using AI and machine learning to analyze images, uh, we're looking at a, you know, a drone opportunity to actually analyze power lines and predict when things are going to fail ahead of time. So we're doing a lot of cutting edge projects with outside industry and connecting them to uh, to faculty and projects that we have. Yeah, that's really interesting because, you know, uh, when, when I first knew like a little bit about your background, I mean, like we talked and you know, I did my research or whatever, uh, but then kind of like knowing what Visicall was and then, you know, what you're doing here and I was like, I wonder, especially like because of the stuff that we talked about kind of walking through right. like with the printers and all that, like to me, uh, you know, granted, this is like my expertise. So there's like, this is low level, you know, <laughs> um, but I do think like the, you know, the stuff that you're doing, I think it's really interesting and like a good way to kind of marry your previous role right. into doing this kind of stuff. And then when you did get here, were you like uh, kind of, dealing with the academia side, was that something that was now like a new thing that you kind of had to tackle, like a new uh, hurdle for you? 
I think for most people, it would be a hurdle and something they wouldn't like dealing with. With my prior company, most of our employees were PhDs. Okay. PhDs are brilliant, extremely high IQ, but they tend to not want to work with other people. They're pretty siloed. So corralling them together for a common goal, that is challenging. Yeah. And it's very different from industry where you just tell somebody what to do and they do it. Um, especially in academia, PhDs are their own kings of their own kingdoms. And you have to work with them. You have to understand what their interests are and what their needs are. So it's, it's I wouldn't say it's difficult. It's just very different. Sure. It's a different way of working. But for me, you know, ever you're getting cynical about the world or anything, I would talk to a faculty, um, you know, a researcher that just focused on one singular thing, whether it's fuel cells, for example, or microfluidics devices. They just want to solve a problem because they love science. They don't care about money. They don't care about business or yeah. fame. I mean, sure, they want a publication. They want grant dollars. But for them, it's just like the pure pursuit of science. To me, that's just the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. So I, I love meeting with them. It's tough to corral them towards something, hit timelines and deadlines. But like basic research and creating knowledge doesn't have timelines. Yeah. So it's like this walking two worlds where we have a business, this is NJI, and we have to work with faculty and try and get them to a deliverable and an outcome. But we have to let them do what they do in academia. So it's cool. I like both worlds. Yeah, really sure. Do. And I think, yeah, that I, I like the way that you kind of talk about, you know, bridging that gap almost. Um, and I think it was the, like, we were talking about Wes Matthews from Choose New Jersey before. Right. And I think it was his episode we were talking, and I learned something in that where it was, I think New Jersey has more PhDs and engineers per capita yeah. than any state yep. in the country, which is another crazy stat but just shows how smart we are. But then I think you take that and you drill it down even further to NJIT, which is one of the top, you know, uh, polytechnic institutes in the country also, right. um, and being able to like have that connection. So could you speak on a little bit on when NJIT decided to kind of make that move and be like, we need to have our own place where we can, right. you know, uh, do what you were doing, like I said before, about uh, connecting to the outside world and not just being like kind of in that silo, but doing stuff with, other local organizations and all that kind of stuff. Sure. So NGI was formed just about 10 years ago. So over the last 10 years, NGI's organization has done roughly $330 million in revenue over 10 years. And it was originally started by the former president of NGIT, Dr. Joel Bloom, with uh, Dr. Don Sebastian, who's a faculty there. And um, for them, I think they, they were able to put their egos aside as an academic institution and say, we have this problem, which is it's tough to work with us, which every university has, but they distinctly went out and said, we're going to do something about it. We're going to create this separate entity that doesn't have to deal with the bureaucracy of an academic institution. We're going to hire quick. We're going to go after things. We're going to kill things fast and they don't work. So I think for them, that was really incredible for them to do that. There's other universities that have a similar model, but it's definitely not the norm, but it allows us to do things other folks just simply can't can't do. Yeah. So I give them a tremendous amount of credit. It allows us to do some really unique things too. So we can actually start for-profit C corporations as a 501c3. So most recently we sold the company for $73 million, which was um, biocentric, a cell and gene therapy manufacturing company. We incubated it. We built all the staff, the whole team within NJIT and NGI, and then we sold it. And that was a unique opportunity where we recognized there was a gap in the marketplace. We had clean rooms, we had staff. Why don't we just go build it? Universities can't do that. So yeah. us in this unique position and business model we have allows us to go after things like that. So I give them a lot of credit for that. Yeah, for really sure. forward thinking for them. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you, when you are bridging that gap and kind of like over time, and I do want to get into a little bit about like how you guys pick what you're working on, um, but like the types of organizations that you're working with now, like we were talking off mic before about some, uh, but so just to kind of put in perspective for people listening, who are you working with to, you know, bridging that gap from NJIT and those PhDs that you're working with to who? Oh, it's a good question. So the facility we're sitting in now, um, big partnership with Department of Defense. So here we're trying to test equipment before it goes in the military. So we're looking at 3D printers. We're looking at all different types of equipment for doing analysis of printed parts, for verification, validation. So we're a test bed for them. So that's our partnership, I say, with the DOD. But something more specific, like we're with body cameras, the end customer there is you know, Newark Police Department, sure, yeah, yeah. prosecutor's yeah. office. But we're trying to partner with organizations that make body cams, that make software, to actually have a partner on those products. Projects where we're the ability, we have the ability to work with faculty to build software to pull all that together. We're trying to help those commercial partners. So we have a, a lot of those relationships where a commercial partner has a very specific problem or pain point, and we're trying to work with them to address it, to pull in faculty, to pull in what their needs are to actually address it. Right. So in that in that ten year span that we're talking about, as different projects kind of present themselves, that's kind of where the focus and the push and the, you know, uh, the research and all that kind of stuff starts going. So it's not necessarily like, hey, we're going to work on 
tanks today. I love, <laughs> love that you guys do tank stuff because um, I would just I would watch the first half of Fury last night. That movie, Fury. it's on Netflix now. Yeah, and that's why I, I was like, <laughs> so find something before bed. And I was like, oh my god, I love this movie. But um, but you know, talking about that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the focus is like finding people that have those pain points or organizations that have pain points, and then being able to leverage the knowledge and experience and research capacity and all that kind of stuff of you know, PhD students and PhDs and all that. It, it depends. So some okay. of it is driven by us. Some of it's driven externally. So for being here and having this conversation, part of this is saying, hey, we're, we're open for business. If you have a specific pain point, you think NGIT could help, we'll be the conduit to make that happen. So we have some companies that come to us and say, we're interested in drones. Who do you have working on drones? Mm -hmm. We'll try and pull in faculty. We'll try and create some kind of sponsored research project and work together on that. In other cases, we as NGI, we're having conversations with partners all the time. And we might say it's a really good idea to build a company that does X. And with that, we can pull in this partner, we can pull in this faculty, and we can pull it all together and piece it together. Um, or a big piece that we do is also professional development. So we might say we have five faculty really good at training in these areas. We have this specific need for this company, whether it's um, NJ Department of uh, Transportation or whomever, and let's make that program for them. So it kind of depends. It's outside in and also inside out. Sure. And so when you take over, you said four months ago, um, and you know, knowing uh, what the positives that have come out of this place have been and, and all that and the great uh, you know, foresight like we talked about from the people at NJIT. But when, we're, uh, when you come in here and obviously like knowing all those things, do you kind of have like a, a perspective shift a little bit to kind of like, first you have to kind of, I would guess, gather all the stuff that you've done already, right. understand it, know what you need to do like with, with any job. Right. Uh, but then at the exact same time too, like it's yours now. Like you're kind of driving the ship, so to speak. Right. Um, so was there like a, you know, uh, almost like a mindset shift at all with, you know, how this place was running and all that kind of stuff? Like talk to me a little bit about that. I would say there has been. And for us, we have this great opportunity that when we sold Biocentric, this company for 70 plus million dollars, we're able to take that funding and actually put it into NGIT and NGI for new initiatives. So part of me coming on board was investing significantly into NGI. Yeah. And for us, our goals organization over the next six, seven years is a double the size the organization by both people, but also revenue coming in the door that allows us to go after much bigger opportunities, much bigger projects, much bigger uh, contracts and grants. So we have, um, I would say more of a growth mindset now. Sure. And while we're a 501 C three and we are, you know, a nonprofit is really we're tax exempt is the way we're looking at it. So the strategy of before let's lose money. It's like, no, no, let's not lose money. Let's, yeah. let's make money and let's also grow, but we're tax exempt. So we're running it more, I would say as a business philosophically than we have in the past, we don't want to be financially dependent upon NGIT. We actually want to send NGIT money and give them um, the goodwill of the work that we're doing, which is our intent and our purpose. So for us, um, that philosophy, I would say, is changing. Yeah. We have a couple of pretty key growth initiatives I'm trying to go after, one of which is actually standing up a venture studio, so building companies intentionally as NJI. Historically, we've built some for-profit C-corporations, but going forward, we really want to get intentional about pulling in a corporate sponsor, pulling in research from, um, from the university, actually building companies, putting a CTO and a CEO in place, putting money into it, actually building corporations. So that's something we're getting more intentional about. Um, we're expanding marketing a lot. So we're trying to get our message out there. And then also going after just much bigger grants. Historically, we've uh, worked with NGIT on some. We've gone after some state-level contracts, some federal funding. We're starting to try and claw at much bigger grants and opportunities to help us expand our organization. Yeah. That's really cool. And I'm, I'm going to jot that down. Make money, not lose money. There you go. That's, that's a good note. I'm going to walk away with anything <laughs> from this episode. That's business. Um, so before we take our break, uh, I do want to ask one question that I just kind of thought of while you were telling, the, giving this answer. When you said, so you started four months ago, uh, you've had your first conversations with the people that were the place six months about prior to that and said, that would be a really cool place to work or whatever. Like, was there something in particular that you were like, that's dope. I need to, <laughs> like, get my hands on that in some capacity. Like, was there a certain specific thing that really lit the bulb for you? For me, and this is not me just saying this as the president of NGI, I've always felt that universities were this goldmine of ideas. There's all these patents that are stuck. And there's also not even just patents. There's way more just ideas that faculty have because faculty are on the cutting edge. But the professor doesn't want to leave their tenure track position. The grad student wants to have a six-figure job because New Jersey is really expensive. Sure. So you have all these ideas that are just stuck. So for me, I've always been really passionate about how do you get ideas out of academia. And I'm not, I'm literally not saying that. I've always had this conversation 
conversation with other people. And then when this role came out, and like, oh, we're designed to get ideas out of academia. I was like, that's exactly what I'm passionate about. Like <laughs> yeah. that, I didn't know that existed. Yeah. So I was very excited when that um, that popped up. But I think um, moreover, my my path with Visicall was taking IP out of the university, standing it up, getting into the outside world. And if we hadn't done that, it would have languished and we'd never been there. But we turned it into a company which was helping pharma companies get drugs to market, testing drugs to see if they were safe. So we had a really meaningful impact in the world just because we were willing to do that. And if the right framework's in place, we can get more of that out of NGIT and into the outside world. And I think if all universities took more, um, you know, kind of unique approaches and adopted different um, paths to market with that, we could have a much more innovative world and country, a lot more cool technologies, like all of you know, the stuff you see here. Yeah. So I'm just very passionate about that. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and that was a great first segment. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the stuff that we kind of have in the background of the shot and like some of that kind of stuff uh, when we come back for the second uh, segment. But so this is the Greens for the Garden State podcast. I'm Mike Ham. Oh, Greens for the Garden State podcast powered by the New Jersey Lottery. I always mess that up on the outro. Uh, I'm Mike Ham. We're here at with Michael Johnson, president of the New Jersey Innovation Institute at NJI's Comet Advanced Manufacturing Facility. We'll be right back. The Mayo Performing Arts Center is the heart of arts and entertainment in Morristown, New Jersey. MPAC presents over 200 events annually and is home to an innovative children's arts education program. To see MPAC's upcoming schedule of world-class concerts, stand-up comedy, family shows, and more, head to mayoarts.org or just click the link in our show notes. Hey folks, I want to tell you about the crew over at Make Cool Shit. These are the magicians who recently gave our podcast a jaw-dropping makeover. You know how we roll here at Greetings with the Garden State podcast, right? We're all about that Garden State attitude. Well, Make Cool Shit shares that same vibe, and they've got something absolutely epic to offer. It's called the Unlimited Cool Shit Design Subscription. It's a game changer, my friends. Imagine this, unlimited creativity, one flat monthly fee, and none of that boring stuff. It's like having your very own army of design superheroes on speed dial. Whether you're a fresh race startup or a seasoned business looking to shake things up, the team at Make Cool Shit has got your back. It's all about making your brand sizzle no matter where you are in your journey. So if you're ready to turn your ideas into mind-blowing realities, then it's time to connect with Make Cool Shit. To check them out on Instagram at at WeMakeCoolShit or visit their website, WeMakeCoolShit.co. Remember, that's co, not com. Greetings from the Garden State is proud to be partnered with some amazing brands. A special thanks to LeGrand Coffee House, our official coffee, and Birdling, our official travel bag. To learn more about these and all of our other great sponsors, head to GreetingsFromTheGardenState.com. All right, we're back for segment two of this episode of Greetings from the Garden State, powered by the New Jersey Lottery. I'm your host, Mike Cam. We're here with Michael Johnson, president of the New Jersey Innovation Institute at NJI's Common Advanced Manufacturing Facility. That's the second to last time I have to go through that whole <laughs> title, but it's important to make sure that everyone knows where we are. But we talked a little bit off mic about, uh, you know, kind of, or on mic, really, about all the stuff that you guys are doing here. There's huge 3D printers. You were showing me, like, metal 3D printers, which I didn't even know existed up until today, um, all sorts of stuff. You're doing work with tanks and, like, again, tanks, but also so, so many different cool things. Um, I told you just before that, like, this is a little bit different than what a normal episode for this show is, just in the sense that we do, like, places that people can interact with in, somehow, in some way, whether it's, like, a hospitality industry type place, a musician they can go here play, like, stuff like that. Why should an average New Jerseyan care about what we're talking about today and what you guys are doing here as you tr try to grow the awareness around what NJI does? That's a good question. So NJIT is a, a state university. So our tax dollars are going towards NJIT. And a big piece of that is we want it to be more than just educational um, uh, organization. We also want the actual property, the ideas that are generated there to actually leave and turn into products and services that impact the world. So part of it's that altruistic goal. The other piece of it is, as New Jersey, we want to have good jobs. We don't want our kids to go to a state school and just leave the state. We don't want our kids coming to other schools out of state. We want them to stay in New Jersey and build up the innovation economy in New Jersey. So I think for us, a big piece of that is trying to help build companies to build ideas that have all those PhDs. You mentioned the highest PhDs um, per capita in the country. We want them to stay in the state and go into companies that actually change the world. So having high paying jobs, having really impactful businesses, that's part of the outcome of what we're trying to do here. We'd like to build companies with the IP that we have that can change the world, but also employ New Jerseyans. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the way they, that that's framed too, because I think, you know, especially the relationship with NJIT is important because there, there are other obviously great technical institutions right. that exist in the country but if you have really smart people here, you want them to stay here. And that is certainly like uh, for New Jersey as a whole, 
a pain point right now. More people are leaving the state than staying and coming in right. um, at this point. And obviously, like, that's not a sustainable way to keep a population high and smart. Um, so as we're talking about this stuff, I, I do want to learn a little bit more through the relationship with NJIT when you're, we're talking about how the, what students and stuff like that interact with uh, NJI. Talk to me about that, uh, because like you said, there's like student projects around here. There's maybe even some behind us. Um, so talk to me a little bit about kind of how that relationship works. So if somebody does go to NJIT and they do somehow get connected here, right. like what, what are they going to be working on? So specific to this facility at Comet, um, every summer, and we're trying to expand this beyond the summers, we have an internship program where students are learning uh, cutting edge advanced manufacturing techniques. They're learning software. They give an example some of the stuff sitting behind us here. We have a couple drones, a couple tanks. Um, we work with the DOD to get real world problems that students are working on in teams. So they're coming, they're getting a problem, they're working through that problem the course of summer, they're building a drone that operates in the Arctic, they're building a tank that can go over certain surfaces. Um, so they're getting a real world problem and not only are they working on it, they're doing engineering, they're learning 3D printing and coding, they're also working as a team. So for engineers and STEM folks, they don't always work on a team, they work in silos. So to get three or four really diverse candidates together and have them work together on a common goal, that teaches them teamwork. That's really really tough to do in uh, STEM-related fields. So that's something we're focused here on a comet. But with NJI, our mission is to leverage resources from NJIT, not just faculty, also students. As we try and launch companies, as we try and get IP out of the university, as we try and get industry partners, there's always a focus on trying to involve students. So if we go to an industry partner and they're interested in investing in sponsored research, we're going to push them to hire co-ops and interns from NJIT. We're going to try and bring them students that meet their needs um, and get those students in front of those folks. So that's always an emphasis of all the work that we're trying to do is leverage those students and faculty as much as possible. And we're trying to expand these programs because the, uh, the cohort that we had come out of here um, this past summer, they're doing a real world research today. When they come out of university, they're going to companies that are really having an impact. And those employers want those hands-on skills. They want yeah. students that worked on projects, that have problem solved, that have come in and kind of matched adversity. Because these students don't always get along and having them work through that conflict, work through projects and have that deliverable at the end it's super impressive and it gives them experience that just other students who are just in the classroom are not getting. So that experiential learning is a big piece that we're trying to do. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think another big part of that too is it's like a, like a maximization of your education, like another thing, another piece that NJIT can offer right. that most other universities and stuff, even in the state can't really, which I think is really important and a good way to kind of, you know, like, Hey, come to NJIT. We are trying to always push students um, at the university, whether undergrad or grad level, to work with corporations to get real world experience and not just be in that classroom. So that experiential learning is part of everything that we're doing and trying to build students to be more well-rounded. So it's definitely a huge part of the curriculum. Yeah, for sure. Um, so can we talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we have a little bit more specifically? So um, like behind us here is a big like 3D printer. And there's 3D printers like literally all over the place right. um, that do plastics, metals, other uh, materials that like we saw in the back. Um, <clears throat> talk to me about like the stuff that you're doing with those and like a little bit more uh, specifically like the types of projects that you're working on now. There's uh, this huge foundational problem in America, which is that over the last 40 or 50 years, we've closed tens of thousands of factories. We don't make stuff. Um, NGIT, our, our motto is NGIT makes, so we're trying to make things. And as we look towards the future, as we look towards future conflicts relative to um, the DOD, we don't have the capacity we need. We further don't have the ability to work, make a lot of the things that we need for, for uh, planes, for, for tanks, you know, like the tanks, um, and all the things that we need to actually have a, a military. So for us, a big focus here is how do we employ new technologies for advanced manufacturing that use less people, that print at a higher skill, that use unique materials that we can't otherwise um, work with. And a lot of the work that we're doing here is testing really new equipment to see how it performs, how it operates. We're working closely with the DOD to test equipment before it goes on base and before it's actually put through its paces, whether it's um, you know rapid 3D printing with plastic or, or metal 3D printing or fabrication. We're trying to test that here. In the process, we're training students to actually work with that equipment who hopefully will help lead that revolution in manufacturing. But we're trying here to identify how do we build that workforce and how do we evaluate technologies which can help us build some of that manufacturing base back. Yeah. Um, so we look at all sorts of equipment here, whether it's printers or verification equipment. So if we print something, how do we prove that's actually the right size? How do we prove that every single time we print it, it comes out the same way, the materials, the quality are the same? So a lot of that basic work we're doing here at this uh, common facility, and that's going to be integral for us to actually building that capability in the U.S. Yeah. 
Uh, we talked about this kind of peripherally, and in that answer, it did make me think about it. And the stuff that we were talking about when we were going through the tour, like the United States overall has like a big problem just in terms of like, we don't really make anything anymore. And obviously like this is a place where you make stuff. Right, right. Um, so like, I know we've talked about it, but it may be like a little bit more specific because we talked about like the clean room back there right. and that kind of stuff. Talk to me about how you kind of balance that with, you know, obviously trying to generate not just like an interest, but an uh, opportunity for good jobs, manufacturing opportunities, like all that kind of stuff with almost like a societal problem where there isn't necessarily like that much manufacturing out there right, right now. So kind of how do you like marry that and kind of fix that problem, I guess. The sweet spot with that is doing both at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to have that bigger societal impact and improve those big shortcomings. At the same time, we're training workforce, we're building advanced capabilities, trying to get people trained on the most up-to-date technologies, but we're also going to industry and asking what problems do you have? Do you need people that use this piece of equipment? Do you need people that are trained in uh, printing electronics? What do you actually need? Trying to build a workforce, but also trying to test those technologies here. So we're constantly trying to um, work with industry and find out just what their needs are. Yeah. So we're actively engaging with our board of directors, our board of trustees to understand what it is that your companies actually need. And they might tell us, we have no interest in this specific thing, but we're really interested over here. We want to 3D print tungsten, but we have no interest in this other thing. Okay, well, that's a new thing that we should go into and a new thing that we should help out with. So we're looking outside to try and get some insight on that. Yeah. But the sweet spot is having that impact, having the cool technologies and meeting what the sponsors actually want at the same time building that workforce. Yeah. And I imagine also too, it it's, must be a lot of staying up to date on like legislation and things that are coming out and right. different, you know, I, lack of a better term, like agendas that are being pushed right. um, to try to make sure that like, you know, if someone does come to you with a project, Obviously, like you want to work on it because you want to give opportunities right. to your students and all the people that are working here and everything. But then at the exact same time, if that's like so far off the like, right. you know, the reservation on where the focus should be going, I think like, I would imagine that kind of comes into play quite a bit as well. We're, we're constantly looking at that. So there's the CHIPS Act. So we're not manufacturing chips in the U.S. There's a huge amount of money. We're trying to help support that, whether it's training or having a test bed here for different types of equipment. Um, we're doing that. There's also the replicator initiative. So battle, um, this warfare is changing a lot in the last decade. So now we're looking at the conflict in the Ukraine and we're going through a million plus drones a year on both sides. Um, we don't have the manufacturing capability to do that, whether it's chips, whether it's motors or parts or propellers or what have you. So as we look at those problems and those initiatives, we say, how can we help with that? Can we do a challenge where we promote technologies that are manufactured in the U.S. only and push people into teams to go after that? Can we take a piece of equipment from a partner and put it through its paces here and partner with Picatinny? So we're always looking for ways to you know, take a look at that agenda and say, how do we fit into that? How can we actually help with that? Yeah. So we always constantly have an eye. And we're looking five, 10 years out in the future, especially the pace things are changing. Last 10 years, things, in, especially in, in defense and warfare, have changed dramatically. You have a, you know, a single drone can knock out a $25 million tank now. It's unreal. Yeah. So a huge change. Yeah, for sure. I, I do also want to touch on the fact that, like, I know we're talking a lot about defense and wartime stuff and all right. that, but I do know that you guys do a lot in the healthcare space Correct. as well. Um, so if you talk about maybe some of the stuff that you're working on, maybe, whether it's now or, you know, significant projects maybe that you've worked on, um, in that space as well, because I think that's important to note that this is not just like, correct, we make tanks, you know, like <laughs> we do like a lot of stuff to help a lot of people. Uh, yeah, yeah. So NGI is organized in four divisions. We're focused here today on, uh, on defense, so sure. the facility, but other divisions, healthcare is our biggest. We've got 80 people in healthcare. And in there, what we're doing a lot of is trying to tie these disparate data systems together. You have that experience of going to the doctor and you fill out the form, you have the different doctor, you fill out the same exact form. Those doctors probably aren't looking at the same databases. So we actually run for the Department of Health in New Jersey, um, the systems and processes for tying all those disparate sources together. Interesting. So there's a single place that a, a, a physician can actually look and get all that data. We've been doing that for a number of years. That's probably our largest program um, as NGI. And we also have entrepreneurship, which is a division we're trying to spur innovation at the university. So we're looking at IP, we're trying to commercialize it, we're looking at building companies, we're doing programming, so events, trying to build an ecosystem. Because um, New Jersey, is, as Wes had pointed out, and some of the other folks, it, it doesn't have a great uh, innovation entrepreneurship ecosystem like Boston or like um, South San Francisco for, for biotech, for example. So we're trying to build that ecosystem, bring people together, bring VCs with folks. We're doing a lot of events in that area. 
And then the fourth division is professional and corporate education. So actually training workforces and actually building content or we're directly leveraging faculty from NGIT to teach those classes. Um, whether it's uh, program management, whether it's cybersecurity, we're trying to build those programs and leverage being an academic institution to, uh, to help out with that. Um, but yeah, healthcare for us is the biggest focus area. But we're trying to build all the other ones. And then also in the process, build out new divisions as well, because we want to be mirrored to NGIT where we do things that they also do. So healthcare, while it's our biggest division, it's not very well mirrored to NGIT. So we're looking at more engineering oriented divisions to stand up in addition to the four we already have. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think that's important to note just because, like you said, when we're here at the Comet facility, we're talking a lot about defense right. and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're right down the street, essentially, from Picatinny. Correct. Um, but there's so much more. And I think that does go back to kind of like what we were talking about at the beginning of the segment with the average New Jersey. And like one of the things we were talking about, the Helix Project and all that, was like stuff that's going to like change people's lives in some way. Right. Um, especially like on the healthcare side, that's a right. big thing, you know. Right. And, and that, that change, so it's Helix or Hacks or um, SciTech City, that's been huge in the last 10 years. And I think New Jersey has taken big strides in the innovation economy, as cheesy as it sounds. When I, um, when I first started VisiCall, a little, little thereafter, Governor Murphy had to be come and speak at a, a conference, and behind us was this big banner, red banner, you know, building the innovation economy. And I thought, that's silly. We're not going to actually do that. But we've done that. Yeah. The last 10 years, the programs that the EDA is doing, um, you look at Helix, where Rutgers, where I came from, there was nothing that... So for innovation in New Jersey, it's come such a far way. And for the average New Jersey, and that's going to mean jobs. Even with Helix, just getting Amtrak to stop there yeah. often yeah. means that people can now work in New Jersey that live elsewhere. They can come, they can commute, they can build companies more easily, they can access capital. So all those little things go a long way. It's tough to put your finger on an ROI or specific for a specific person, but there's a lot going on. Yeah. It's a very short period of time. Yeah, and I think like it's some of the, what like, you know, we, we talk about, what you guys are doing here specifically. And I think it's one of those things where people, like you said, 10 years, people may not, or probably not aware that this, unless you have like some maybe connection to <laughs> NJIT or to you or to something. Right. Um, but I do think that like the average New Jerseyan to, probably doesn't know that this exists. Correct. But, but should know that there's a lot of stuff happening in New Jersey, especially here, that it is super important for a lot of people, right. and it's going to impact a lot of people. And who would even think that it comes from right. the Garden State? You know, and I think that's really cool. And the trajectory, I think, is if we keep this up, we keep putting money towards programs that actually allow innovation to happen. You put all the pieces together, whether it's facilities or people or funding, we will eventually get to a point, perhaps not like San Francisco or Boston, but we're going to get close. And that will allow us to look back and say, wow, New Jersey is a place to actually start companies and keep companies and do innovative stuff and keep all those PhDs in the state. So that's the long-term goal. And that will affect regular people in the state in a very positive way. Yeah. Um, so before we get, because we're, believe it or not, we're almost done. <laughs> uh, this has been great. And I'm sure we could talk for forever after, but um, you know, when we're talking about, like you mentioned before, staying five to 10 years ahead of kind of what is needed um, and all that kind of stuff. So talk to me a little bit about like the five, 10 year plan. Like you start here, like you're doing your thing. What are kind of like the big focuses and the big pushes? Obviously growing some of the other uh, platforms and, you know, different uh, arms that you guys have. But are there like specific things that you're trying to make happen? The top, like you said, is growing revenue. We led yeah. to close to $80 million in six, seven, eight years down the road. Um, that will allow us to have double the team, double the impact. But to actually get there, we have to invest in our growth. So we're looking at, I mentioned the venture studio concept of building companies. By 2030, we'd like to sell another for-profit company. So we have to start a whole bunch of them. So we're trying to start at least one or two companies per year that leverage NGIT and NGIIP that we can actually turn into real companies with folks working on really cutting edge projects. And that um, will allow us to really generate revenue to go after all sorts of different new opportunities. And I would be uh, remiss if I didn't mention AI. It's like the sexy thing everyone mentions. We do have a number of the companies that we're looking at and programs we're looking at that do leverage AI to address all sorts of different questions, like you know, looking at power lines in New Jersey. Are they fraying? We have to send a crew to fix them. There are all sorts of questions where we can use AI to address new problems. And I think for us, it's leveraging those really cutting edge technologies, whether it's a company or a partnership or sponsored research to go after really cool cutting edge work. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of different things. It's trying to build up all of our different divisions today and then also pursue new opportunities as they pop up. Awesome, awesome. Uh, well, this has been great. Uh, so before the people go, I do want to give them links, places they should be going to learn more, 
uh, you know, I'm like get involved is not the right word, but <laughs> you know, like different ways that they can learn more about what's going on here and, and if they're interested in all that kind of stuff. So uh, let's hit them with some links. Yeah, that's link for NGI in particular is NGI.com. Um, for us too, though, I, I run the Office of Corporate Engagement for NJIT and NJI. So as far as um, you know, partners wanted to work with university, whether it's students or co-ops or internships or sponsored research, we are that conduit between the outside world and NJIT. So really anyone who wants to leverage a leading R1 research institution, reach out to us. Yeah. I'd be more than happy to help out with that. Awesome. Whatever the mechanism is. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so we'll make sure we put those that stuff in the show notes as well so people can just go click. Um, also, greetingsweguardstate.com, which will, will be in there too, uh, which you can get to all of our other great episodes that we've had up to this point. This is episode 119. Wow. That's a lot of episodes. <laughs> Sometimes I forget that I've been doing this show that long. Um, but, uh, Michael, thank you so much for jumping on with us today. This was amazing. Like, I appreciate you having me down the tour. I'm going to take some, like, pictures and stuff before we, before we roll out of here. But uh, I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, and then we'll just have to see how many listens and views this one gets and <laughs> not start a sibling war, but whatever. That's, that's not my problem. Uh, but uh, so thank you everybody for listening. Uh, this has been the Greatest Cigar State podcast powered by the New Jersey Lottery. We were here with Michael Johnson, president of the New Jersey Innovation Institute at NJI's Comma Advanced Manufacturing Facility. Thank you for listening and we will catch you next time. Dude.